Take your Bibles, please, this morning and turn to the book of Ephesians. I am excited about this study. I hope that uh, you will be as well and that together we'll learn many great truths from the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 1. And I think it's good practice for us to read the scriptures, even though we're only going to cover part today. Uh, not a very major part of the book, just an introduction, but it's good for us to become familiar with the text. And I will ask you, in respect for God's word, to stand with us as I read Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be, the Father, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which, you has, which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And our Heavenly Father, this morning, as we open your word, we pray that the Spirit of God would open our eyes, that we truly would, through his gifts and who is, through his ability in our lives, understand the truths of God's word. For the things that we know, remind us, impress them upon our hearts. For the things that we do not know, teach us. For the things that we need, remind us through the spirit of God of the greatness of your word and power in the text. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We are people of the book. If we were able to have a big sign out the front, we would say that we are people of the book. We believe as Christians of the underlying conviction that the, the Bible is God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by God or God breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And we believe that God's spirit has been given to God's people so that through God's word and the enlightening ministry of the spirit of God, God's world might be brought to know and believe in God's son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a mouthful. But we believe that. Let me digress for just a moment. This morning I'm trying something new with the outlines we usually have at the back of the, of the auditorium. There's usually a printout of the, uh, the PowerPoint. But I've also put together, and didn't take too long, an in, uh, just a little booklet that fits into your Bible with little blanks to fill in. For those of you who are students and wish to take notes, you might see that as an option. So I'll leave that with you uh, for the next coming weeks. 
John 16, 8 through 11 says, And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's the Spirit of God's role, is to open our eyes to understand where we are spiritually. Alistair Begg says, This is the teaching of God's Word, the Bible, both the proclamation of the truth and then there is the receiving of the truth. The Lord gave a parable at one point about the sower and the seed. Many of us are familiar with that in Mark 13 and or Matthew 13 and Mark 4. It's the parable that Jesus, where Jesus makes it perfectly clear that not all the seed always finds fertile or receptive ground. Some seed, when it's sown, falls on rocky ground or on the path, some on shallow soil and some among thorns. For some, there seems to be small response and for others, no response. In the 18th century, a Puritan preacher by the name of William Perkins, Perkins spoke to his students at that time, reminding them that whenever the word of God is spoken to people, it would be spoken to those who are of a variety of listening skills. And the same is true today. Some will be unbelievers who know nothing about the gospel, and they don't care to know anything about the gospel. They really don't know anything about Jesus and the Bible and the gospel, but they don't care that they don't know. And there may be some here this morning who fall into that category. We're not going to ask you to stand and identify yourself. But deep down inside, you may know that's true of you. You're here because someone forced you to come or someone uh, brought you and against your own will. But, but you're here, but you don't care to be here. I trust that at the end of this message, that will be different. Others here have heard about Jesus, the Bible, the church, and Christians. And you know that you don't have a good understanding of the truth, but you're willing to listen. God bless you for that. I pray that you will. Some here know what the gospel is. You've heard it before. You know the basics, but you've never humbled yourself before God. You've never admitted that you're in need of a savior. You could probably even repeat the gospel. You might even be able to lead someone to the Lord yourself, but you've never made it a personal choice to receive Christ as your savior. You'd have to admit, you're thinking inside your heart, this is not for me. I don't believe it. And there are many other potential endless numbers of categories of people in spite of that, we continue to sow the word. Why? Because of our ability? No, because of the power of the word of God. It's not in our ability as the sower. It's not in the methods that we use. It's in the power of the word that God uses it to save people. You and I might sow the seed like, here's a little, there's a little. Or we might be really enthusiastic and spread a whole lot with all the energy that we possibly have. It's not up to us. We sow faithfully as we're able to but we trust in the lord to take his word as isaiah said that it will succeed into that which it is sent well the book of ephesians i say that as an introduction because we're going to be getting into some very deep and very wonderful truths in the first three chapters of ephesians uh, not today this is an introduction and hopefully it'll whet your your appetite for the book uh, but in the first three chapters of or, or the book of ephesians only has six chapters had 155 verses, so let me encourage you this morning to take your Bible and read the book of Ephesians. Uh, I have often put it on my phone, and I walk around this auditorium. It takes about 20, 15 to 20 minutes to read or to walk through the book of Ephesians. You could do it on your own in the same amount of time, and what a blessing it is to be reminded of some of these great truths. So if you have 15 minutes, rather than watch the next YouTube short, or a little series of YouTube short and get caught up in those and spend an hour or two, like my wife sometimes does. No, like, <laughs> like I sometimes get caught. Spend 15 minutes of that listening to the word of God as uh, God speaks to us. Take your, take your phone or take your iPad or whatever it is and just hit that little button and uh, allow it to do its work in your life. And why the whole book at one time? In order to get the full picture. When you get a letter from someone, you don't just read the first few words and then skip over a couple of pages, read a couple of words, and then come to the conclusion that you know what it's all about. You read the whole thing. When you have your favorite music on, on the, the radio or, your, or your, your MPs or whatever people use these days, um, you listen to the whole song because it's your favorite. Well, become used to reading the Word of God if you can like that. Read what God has written and what Paul has written to the church at Ephesus all in one shot. Reading the Bible for yourself uh, and memorizing what you can are the first steps in good Bible study. 
And just so, as I mentioned, just a couple of initial observations this morning to challenge us in the book of Ephesians, because next Sunday, as Pastor Daniel mentioned, we're at the park, River Bend, right? River Bank. I'm going to change the name so I can be right. <laughs> Discovery Center. And, uh, and so if you come here next Sunday and the parking lot is empty, one of two things has happened. <laughs> one, it's a clear indication that you have not received Christ as your Savior and we are gone. <laughs> or secondly, you can admit that you simply forgot. There'll be a sign on the door to remind you. But, you know, I, I thought about that first one, and I thought there is going to be coming a day, and I thought I'd slip it in here. When I used to come home from school as a young child, and I would open the door and I would yell, Mom, I'm home. What did I expect? Glad to know you're home. Some kind of response from somebody. Do you know how I felt when nobody responded? I felt, as the movie years and years, years ago was entitled, I felt left behind. And there's going to come a day, and I say this with all love and respect for those of you who do not know the Lord yet, that one day will come and it will be too late. And you will be left behind. Don't let that happen. Receive Christ as your Savior. Go back to Ephesians. Tony Merida, a pastor down in the U.S., wrote in his commentary, Ephesians deepens our understanding of the gospel. Unfortunately, we live in a day without, with much superficial Christianity. Much shallow teaching is going on, but when you get to Ephesians, you dive into what Paul calls the incalculable riches of, of the Messiah. Unsearchable riches, it says in the ESV. Ephesians magnifies the importance of the church, perhaps more than any other New Testament lever, letter, and we also live in a day in which people do not really value the church. They're inclined to think, well, if nothing else is going on this weekend, I guess I could go to church. Yet when we look in the book of Ephesians, we read how the church is central to God's eternal purposes. The church is put in eternal perspective. Through the church, God has chosen to make known his multifaceted wisdom. And Ephesians is a wonderful book, as we'll get into a little later on, on helping us understand what grace is all about. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that what? Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Why? What is this about grace? Why is grace so important a theme in Scripture? Daryl Bach wrote his little book. This little book pack, packs much power. It is a circular letter sent to the Asia Minor region of the early church that reviews core themes of the gospel, the program of God, the church, the mystery, hope, riches, and power of the gospel rooted in grace, not works of the law, and a gospel whose result is reconciliation. The result of all this divine activity, Bach says, is a call to live a distinctive life. I think John Stott's commentary is entitled, A New Society. To live a distinctive life in the world and in our key social relationships in marriage, in the family, and throughout the household. So if you feel tired and lonely and beat up and confused, then welcome to Ephesians. Our souls need to see this description of the glorious grace of God. We need the gospel every day. And you're saying to yourself, you might not ever say it out loud, do I need to hear the gospel every day? Yes. But the gospel is not just the simple gospel story, but as my professor said, it's the gospel story is that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried according to the scripture. He rose again. There were witnesses to that effect. To that effect. And he said there's an apostolic significance to those truths. It's the so what question. The gospel answers that question too. So I believe that Jesus did all those things. So what? Well, the Ephesians, uh, book of Ephesians tells us, so what? Paul is writing this letter to Christian churches, yet he devotes the first three chapters to telling them what the gospel is. They were Christians living in the world, and they needed first to understand who they were, and then how to live. In a nutshell summary, Ephesians answer, helps us answer these questions such as, and you'll see it on the screen, I put those up there, why worship? What should we pray for? What's so amazing about grace? Who are we? We're not Jews, we're not Gentiles now, but we're Christians, a third category. What is that all about? Why is the church such a big deal? What else should we pray for? How can we be and remain united in the church? 
How do new people, like believers, how are we supposed to live? You know, there's a lot of changes that once you receive Christ as your Savior, there's a lot of changes that are expected. Chapter 4 in particular, about things we need to put off or put away and things we need to put on or, or start. What a great chapter, chapter 4. He goes on to tell us how we can imitate God in our lives in chapter 5. What is God's plan for marriage? How should we parent our children? What should be our attitudes at work and how should we behave in the workplace? How do we fight our enemies? Who are our enemies? And how do we win? Wow. That's just the start. That's the book of Ephesians. It's a book that teaches us that God is forming, as I mentioned, a new humanity through Christ by the Spirit. It describes how Jesus Christ died for sinners, was raised and exalted, and now is head of all things, including the church. And by the way, this is his church. When you ask who's in charge of Faith Fellowship Baptist Church, we hope the truth is that what we believe is it's Jesus Christ. It's his church. It's not our church. And the church, by the way, is not a building, is it? This happens to be the facility where the church meets. But the church is God's called out people, holy, faithful followers who follow Jesus Christ, who have accepted him as their savior. That's the church. That's the new community that we are now a part of. Consider some of the radical changes in those who are uh, Christians who believe in Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but now made alive. We were, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 13, separated from Christ, but now we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He says in chapter 2, 19, we were considered strangers and aliens to the grace and to God, but now we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. What we were, what we are, he says in chapter 5, we were in darkness, now we're in light. See any difference? The question is, do we see any difference? Because that's what happened to us. This is what God has done for us. That's why this book is so exciting because Paul is saying in a nutshell, before we can live out the truths of chapters 4 through 6, we need to understand who we are as believers in chapters 1 through 3. What has God done for us? How are we different now than what we used to be? We used to be in darkness, now we're in light and so on. We used to live like the world, now we live like the Lord, hopefully. Well, the opening words attribute this book to the authorship of Paul. Chapter 3, verse 1 confirms it. But it's clear that there are easily, as I mentioned, divisions and outlines for the book, and it's necessary for us to understand those because a lot of people just jump into chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 6 and say, for example, in, in the passages on marriage, you know, wives, submit yourself to your husband, and, and the women are going, I'm not going to do that. Well, you can't do that unless you understand what happened in chapters 1 through 3. We can't live out chapters 4 through 6 until we understand who we are in chapters 1 through 3. What God has done changes how we are to live. What God has provided for us gives us the ability to live out chapters 4 through 6. You've got to keep those divisions in mind. So the book begins with teaching about our salvation. This is our position, who we are in Christ, how Christ sees us. I used to sing a little song, well, we used to sing a little song uh, the previous when I, the church I grew up on. I am covered over with the robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to me. I am covered over with the blood. I am, oh, I've forgotten it now. I'm covered over. <laughs> I am covered over with the robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to me. I'm going to sing it. I am covered over with the robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to me. I am covered over with the precious blood of Jesus, and he lives in me. Oh, what a joy it is to know my heavenly Father loves me so. And when he looks at me, he sees not what I used to be, but he sees Jesus. There. That's a great little chorus. That's all that God has done for me so that when he looks at me now, he sees me differently than he does if I didn't know him. I used to be depending on my own. And now I depend on what Christ has done for me. What a huge difference. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament depended on their good works to enter in favor with God until the Day of Atonement when he covered their sins and now he was able to look upon them and bless them because of the shed blood of the Lamb. The book begins with the teaching of our position. The focusing of the opening chapters is on God. How in his glorious grace he saves sinners through Jesus Christ, granting them eternal life. 
And interestingly enough, and I didn't realize this, but most of the, all the verbs, except maybe one or two in the first three chapters, are in the indicative. For those of you who are English scholars, they're in the indicative, which means this is simply a statement of fact. This is something that God did. He begins in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Wait till we get into that one. In the heavenly places. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us for the adoption to himself. And it goes on and on. All the wonderful things that God has done. I'm not an, e, I'm not an expert in any language, let alone English. But as I was reading chapter 1, I, I noticed and I've been told to in my, writing, in my readings that there's only, I think, two sentences in chapter 1. Did you catch that? There's a lot of commas colons, semicolons, but, but there's no breaks. You know, and if you read it as it's written, you can run out of breath before you get to the end of the first sentence. And then Paul says the second sentence. You know why? It's because he's excited. When you're excited about something, have you ever listened to a little child trying to describe something they're excited about and they never stop, they just keep going on and on and on about how wonderful it is and where they found it and how much it's going to be and how much they're going to use it and how what it's valued before and they just never stop and you're going, Whoa! And that's like Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. He's excited about what he's sharing with us about what God has done for us in providing for us salvation. In this new life, we have been chosen and adopted by the Father. We've been redeemed by the Son. We have been sealed by the Spirit. We've been given resurrection power. We've been given eyes to see the greatness of his power toward us who believe. In chapter 2, we've been brought from death to life. We've been raised and seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We've been created for good works, which we don't have to come up with, but which God has provided for us if we would listen and do his will. Tony Meredith says again, We find here that Christianity is not about becoming religious. It's not about conforming to a list of rules. It is not about adopting a philosophy. It's not about financial prosperity. It's not about becoming a nice person. Christianity is about becoming a new person. It's about going from death to life. It's about going from darkness to light. And the ensuing task of God's people is not to call people to a religion, but to call people to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. What we do on, on Sunday mornings is hopefully build a relationship, not emphasize rules and regulations. Are there rules and regulations to follow in the scripture? Sure, that's chapters 4 through 6. There are things that God tells us we should do, but it's built upon the relationship that we do these things because we love the one who gave us the rules. There's a love relationship that needs to be built. Christianity is more about, it is all about in the beginning what God has done for us, which leads us into a living relationship, a loving relationship, uh, as we grow to know him and understand what he has done for us. So we have a new life in Christ. And we also have a new community in Christ. We see that at the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3. And when God saves us as sinners, he puts us into a new community. And that's why I think part of this is so exciting, because God has been blessing this church. He's putting us as a new community in, the, in, a, in a place where, as, as my wife mentioned, there are new things that are happening. There's new opportunities to see what God is doing. Now, is everything going to, to be perfect? I, I doubt it, because we're not perfect people. Are there going to be things that we need to be patient with with each other? Yes, I'm sure there are. I have to be patient with you, and you have to be patient with me, and especially all the other leaders, but with me. But we have to be patient with each other. God is doing something, and we don't want to fight it. We want to work with him in what he is doing and what he is blessing. That's part of being in the new community. We're not on our own anymore. We're part of the family of God. If you look around this room, just take a quick look around the room. Just, just take a quick look. Not just the people sitting right beside you. Take a look around this room. Because you're going to have all eternity to get to know who these people are. It starts here now, but this is part of our forever family. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are stuck with me forever. Think of that. What a wonderful thought. <laughs> just gives me shivers. But I'm stuck with you. And that scares me. <laughs> we're in this together and God wants it that way we're part of a new community you don't have that at work do you 
You don't have maybe that in, in your natural physical family. Some of us do, some of us don't. But this is a new community. I was talking with someone the other day. And the thing that draws us together is not similar interests necessarily or similar talents or abilities or whatever because, I mean, if you tried to talk to me about fixing a car, you might as well be talking to a wall. If you talk to me about how a computer runs, again, the wall is there. But what draws us together is what we have in common in Christ. And so what is happening here on Sunday mornings is significant, not just for us, but in God's eyes, this is what he designed us to come together for. Not just to stir each other up to love and to good deeds, but it's well beyond that. The mystery that's been revealed in the New Testament that the Old Testament wasn't aware of, that's what the church is. Paul was getting excited about the church. I hope we're getting excited as well. John Stott writes, The church lies at the very center of God's eternal purposes. It's not a divine afterthought. It's not an accident of history. On the contrary, the church is God's new community. And for his purpose, it's not just to save individuals, but rather to build up people and to call out of the world a people for his own glory. Wow. See, the world looks at the church as just a building, right? Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. That's that building over there. The one that's across from the 7 and 11. I want people to know that this is the 7, the, church, the 7 11 is across from Faith Fellowship, not Faith Fellowship is across from 7 11. See the difference? If people, I've, I've been asked, where's your church? And you have to basically boil down if they don't know, well, it's across from the, oh, I know where that is. They know where the 7 11 is. They don't know where Faith Fellowship Baptist Church is. It's across the street. Open your eyes. Jim Symbol writes, the, uh, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, Satan knows about the crucial role that local churches play in the building of God's kingdom. In fact, he has suffered much loss when congregations have proper, Satan has suffered much loss when congregations have properly connected with the living Christ. Because of the threat that all Christian congregations are to Satan, churches are his special target. He cleverly uses every device possible to make us ineffective. Satan begins by attempting to deceive Christians concerning the vital importance of the local church and its potential in God. He wants them to think that church is only a place you visit on Sundays if you can spare the time. Our adversary tries to bury some churches under an avalanche of traditionalism and lifeless ceremonies. Many churches he makes ineffective by stifling and discouraging the spirit of prayer. Elsewhere he instigates strife and division, gossip and fighting, all of which are aimed at grieving the spirit's presence and power. Church splits are also beneficial to his demonic design. He tries to neutralize some churches through false doctrine, emotional fanaticism and harsh attitudes. And of course, pastors and other ministers and servants in the church come under continual and intense personal or spiritual attack because Satan knows that many believers are hurt and weakened when a leader falls. Want to know why you pray for your pastors and pray for those in authority over you? That's why. How tragic it is that so many believers pour over their newspapers, he goes to say, to learn about the latest world events when the things that are most important to God are happening right in our own churches. Today we desperately need not only the spiritual revival among our churches, but an awakening to the importance that Jesus places on every Christian organization, every Christian congregation. Do we sense how important this place is? That the people that we're related to in this new community are for us in our lives? It's sometimes evidenced by our faithfulness and attendance. Not that we don't, you know, we, we take attendance, but we're not taking it to, to oh, somebody missed a Sunday. They've lost their salvation. No, they haven't. Maybe they were sick. But if you're gone for a long time, it's important that the shepherd knows where the sheep are, right? Jesus gave a parable that the shepherd had 99, and, and he counted them, and one was missing. So what did he do? Oh, well, I got 99. It doesn't really matter. That one's on its own. You know what would happen? The next week, he'd have 98, and then 97 and 96. The shepherd takes care of the sheep, and we try to do our best. We are going to be hearing a little bit more about flocks in the next month or two here at the church. We've, uh, I'll just say really briefly, and, and hopefully I won't say anything out of, out of line from the elders. They're looking at me like, what's he going to say? <laughs> but for lack of a better term, and I know other churches use different terms. They call them parishes or groups or whatever. 
we, we use the acronym FLOX, which simply means that we're under shepherds as leaders in the church, and we want to care for those who are in, under our care that God has brought. So the church has been divided up into geographical territories, five of them, because there's five elders and myself, six, six groups. And, and so what we want to try to do is a couple of things. We're trying to prepare for those times. Remember COVID? How many of you remember COVID? We don't want to remember COVID, but we have to remember COVID because could it happen again? Yeah, something like that could happen again. The government could come along and say, okay, close your doors and go home. And so we want to be prepared for that. Well, we still want to meet together, so how would we do that? Well, we all could maybe meet in this place, but we could meet in different places. And that's what we're trying to develop is relationships within the area in which you live. So we'll, we'll be spending more time on that a little later, but those are flocks. So that nobody is missed. And, and why another reason why we take attendance, dear old Elaine, you know, sometimes, sometimes, on, on, dear old Elaine, Elaine's at the back, Elaine. <laughs> Dear old, she's, well, I, she, she is older than me, but, <laughs> and she is dear, but sometimes she'll, she'll we'll, we'll go on Tuesday mornings and we'll say, we'll just confirm who was here, who wasn't, maybe, and, and, and on her sheet she'll have a family four. Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> couple three, uh, or a couple two. Who is that? I don't know. Well, we want to try to get past the, uh, I don't know, to find out who God is bringing through these doors. Why? Because every single soul is important to him. And God has brought you and I here for a reason. Not just to fill a seat, but so that we can minister to one another in the body of Christ, through the word of God, through prayer, through our special needs. Something happens to you, we want to be here to help. That's what the church is all about. So just I throw that out there for... You're part of a flock. Steve Timmons says, It's not that I belong to God and then make a decision to join a church. My being in Christ means being in Christ with others who are in Christ. That's my identity. This is our identity. If the church is the body of Christ, then we should not live as disassembled Christians. And I thought there, that's, that's part of our mindset when we, part, we become Christians, we become part of this new community. The mindset is, that you belong to me, I belong to you, you are important to me, I should be important to you. How can I help you? How can I serve you? How can I love you? And the same back. That's part of the mindset. I don't choose to do that. When the Lord saves me, he places me into a new community called the church. Tony Meredith says again, why do Christians hesitate and resist a more important involvement to identify with brothers and sisters in Christ in this new community with whom they have a spiritual and heavenly connection. Now this isn't a, a call for necessarily membership, but we want to encourage you to recognize the importance of membership here at the church. It's the members who have that official say, but everyone who knows the Lord is part of the church, part of the body of Christ. And then I'm running out of time. The second half of the epistle is it has to do with our salvation status that we have before Christ. It's called, instead of our position in Christ, now we're talking about our practice. That's chapters 4 through 6. And all of the, interestingly, all of the verbs in this section are not indicative anymore. Paul changes to the imperative. And if you know what the imperative is, that means God is not giving us suggestions, but he's giving us commands. He's giving us directives. He's not saying, you know what, I'm going to give you a few ideas about how to change your life. He's saying, this is how you change your life. These are the things you need to do now because you're not dead anymore in your trespasses and sins. You are alive now in my son, Jesus Christ. Live like it. That's why he starts off with grace and peace and he writes to the faithful in Christ Jesus because our position now it makes us different in terms of our habits, what our habits should be. So the second half of Ephesians urges us to live a life that draws upon this newness of Christ. Take a, take a look, if you, when you have your Bibles, turn them over to chapter 4. This is, this is how chapter 4 starts. And I think this is, in many ways, we want to get to how this is, can be true in our, in our church family, but it is true because it's based on chapters 1 through 3. But in chapter 4, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner from the Lord, urge you to what? Walk in a manner worthy of of the calling that you have received from Christ. What does that mean? That means, Paul says, you weren't living that way. Now you're saved. Change. 
Now walk in a way that demonstrates you understand that God has done something wonderful in your life and there's got to be some change. Change is hard. I don't like change. Tough. The Lord says it, it is tough, but I've given you the power through the indwelling spirit of God, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and he is with you right till the end until you receive the reward of the inheritance, which I've set apart for you. You have the ability, but you have to choose to be filled with the spirit. You have to allow the spirit of God to control you. You have to allow the spirit of God to help you to make those changes that are necessary to live like my son. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have, been, you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience. And here's a good one. Bearing with one another. Oh, that's tough. Because I want you to hurry up and grow up. Don't you say that to your kids sometimes? Oh, grow up. And you know what? They're trying. We say that to young believers or those who are not as mature in the faith as we are. Just grow up. Well, they're trying. That's the effort that they're putting in. That's the direction that they need to be walking in. And Paul says, be patient with each other and eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And, and Paul says elsewhere, as long as it depends on you or whatever depends on you, you, know, you take the initiative to be the forgiver. You take the initiative to be the reconciler. You take the initiative to be the lover. You take the initiative to be the giver. You take the initiative to be the server. Why? Because that's how Jesus lived among us. That's how God deals with us. We'll find out in chapter 1, the reason we're saved is because God, God took the initiative. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. What does that say? Jesus came to seek and to save those who were found. Jesus came to seek. Isn't that interestingly? Interesting. That's the first thing. He came to seek and save those who were lost. Jesus took the initiative to dwell among us, to be our Savior. The uniqueness of this Christ-centered approach points to a life that comes from God. It's amazing how the early church got a hold of this. And it says in Acts 17, verse 6, they turned their world upside down. Tertullian said a couple of centuries later, they still love each other. They're ready to die for each other. And the world notices those things. Well, in closing, on our last slide there, it says, what happened to the church in Ephesus? Well, like many Christians, they started well. They started off with the truth, based on truth. Think about the fact that they had, they had Paul, and they had Apollos, and they had Timothy, and they had Aquila and Priscilla, all involved in that ministry. And 40 years later, John's writing the, uh, the book of Revelation, and he says, he says a number of things we want to look at quickly. Uh, but we all need to be wary of how quickly our relationship with the Lord can falter or fail. Joseph Stoll writes, one problem in the Christian life or in the Christian experience is that what was meant to be a blessing can change very quickly into being a burden. You ever feel like that? Once was a passion, became a project. Unfortunately, when it gets like that, it can be rather boring at times, and it's, there's not a lot of motivation to stay faithful when time gets tough. If your relation, if you love your relationship with the Lord is suffering this morning, it's hard to be faithful. It's hard to be who you're supposed to be. The book of Ephesians is written in such a way that should reignite our passions for the Lord and for the church. I'm going to skip over the last couple of words or sentences. We'll look at those in later, but turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter or Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but it's written to the church at Ephesus. And you think, well, we're supposed to be in the book of Ephesians. Why are we flipping over to Revelation? Because Revelation is the last word that we get on the church that we're talking about in Ephesians. And when we go through Ephesians, we'll see all the truths that were given to them, all of the blessings that were theirs in Christ. And yet 40 years later, they're struggling. 40 years later, the first generation of believers had lost their first love. They were commended because they were doctrinally sound. You can read that in verses 3 and 4. They, they knew the truth. They stood up against false teaching. They were able to communicate the truth. But Jesus said, I commend you on that, but I, I have something against you. And he says, what I have against you is you've lost your first love. This should be a warning for all of us, a very sober statement. That the Lord can see good in us, but at the same time be disappointed with us. 
We often, like the Ephesians, are guilty of great performances, good living, doing things beyond what we're called to do. We serve at times like the best of them. We can sing and give and pray and love. But is our heart in it? What does it mean you've lost your first love? Well, the idea is that our love for the Lord is no longer a first priority. There are so many other things in our life that have taken over. That we, we do first in the morning or we do last in the evening or we don't think to pray when we start the day. It's, it's sort of like, oh, oh yeah, I should, but it's not a priority anymore. Joseph Stoll says, Jesus is saying to us, you don't serve me because you are driven by your love for me. Your love for me is not anymore a priority. I'm not supreme in what you do. And Jesus said the same thing in his day. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So John and the Lord tells us three things, just in closing. And he says, first of all, he says four things. He says, first of all, I hope you're listening. Because we can think that we're commendable in many areas in our life, and we probably are, as, as many believers are. We, we read the Bible, we pray. But he says that commendability doesn't excuse you for the one thing that you need prioritize, to prioritize. Just like the first commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Jesus said, I need you to get back to the place where you recognize what needs to be a priority in your life. Because I said, he says, I hope you're listening because if you don't heed my rebuke, if you don't change your ways, if you don't stop living for yourself, then you will have a powerless life, a powerless church, a lightless and lifeless church without me. To avoid the absence of the presence of God and the blessings of God in our lives, we're to do three things very quickly. Remember. That's the first word, remember. Remember what? We all have painful memories. He's not asking us to remember the painful memories. He's asking us what? To remember what it was like when you first came to know me. Remember the enthusiasm you had. Remember the passion in your life. Remember the good ways that I have blessed you. Remember the changes that came into your life. Remember the blessing. Remember the good things that God has done for you. Remember this morning. Remember the way you used to read your Bible. Remember the way you used to tell others about the Lord. Remember how you prayed. Remember all those things that you did well. Remember the good things because memories have power. Sometimes we get stuck in bad memories. The, the faults and the failures that we did. The Lord has forgiven us of those if we've asked for forgiveness. So he says, now I want you to remember the things that you used to do that were good, that I blessed you with. Remember. And then he says what? Repent. To turn back to the Lord. To change our minds. Because sometimes if we get stuck in the old without remembering the good, we'll get stuck in the old. We'll stay stuck in the old. And unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians who live their life in the past. They're not victorious in the present. They have no anticipation of the future because they remember the past in a bad way. The Lord says, well, repent of that. Come back to me. He said, and this is the hard part. Because we think, well, repent. I've heard that before. It means to change your mind, to head in another direction. I was heading over this way. Now the Lord saved me. Now I'm heading over that way. So I've repented from my sins. But we forget that every day we need to repent. Every day we need to make that choice to head in the new direction that God has provided for us to walk in. And so he says, would you turn back to me? Not, and, and this idea of repentance is not like trying to turn the Titanic around, right? A huge ship can take hours and days to turn around sometimes, depending on, on what kind of vessel it is. He's not saying, you know, take your time. There's no rush. You know, I know there are things that need to be changed in your life, but I, we've got plenty of time, you know. That's not the word. That's not the way it's used. The Lord says, stop right now from what you're doing that's wrong and start doing what's right. Don't wait until later this evening. Don't wait till later on this week. Don't wait till a year from now saying someday I'm going to get my life right with God. Get it right, he says, now. If the Lord is blessing, then he wants to bless now. He's not giving us promises that he's going to bless us in the future, which he is. But he's saying for you and I right now, if you want to walk with me, you need to repent. You need to look into your life every day and say, well, you know what, Lord, yesterday I, I I, I blew it. I was angry when I shouldn't have been angry. I didn't trust you the way I should have trusted you. 
I didn't read my Bible. I didn't pray. I didn't, I didn't do the things or say the things or meet the people that I should have. And he says, that's okay. I'll forgive you. If you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of those sins. Now, let's start fresh today. Repentance. And then he says, well, what am I supposed to do? He had the third word, remember, repent, redo. Redo the things that you were blessed with in the past. Remember the good things. And if you didn't have any things to remember in the past, if you're new in the Lord, then start doing something that you're supposed to now. But remember, the, the starting of the new is based on what Christ has done for us. We can't do it on our own. Remember, repent, and redo. So you forgive people, for example. You love people. You serve people. Not because they're worthy, but because Jesus said to. And he is worthy. I, I want the Lord to bless this church. I hope you do too. Not because of who we are. We're reading a book as elders, and I haven't given it to them yet, but the one phrase that stuck out in my head is, the church is a huge church, like 16,000 people. We'll be that next week, I'm sure. But 16,000 people, that's not the goal either. The pastor knows that. But he said there was a couple, of, a couple came from another church that he pastors at years before. They came to see what God was doing in this church down in Louisville. And they said, this is wonderful. God is really blessing. He says, and pastor, you're a good pastor, but you're not that good. And he said it was a wake-up call that none of us can claim that what God is doing in blessing is because of us. It's all because of him. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. So remember, repent, and redo. And be blessed as we go through the book of Ephesians. Let's pray. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea. More love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee. More love to thee. I had hoped this morning that we could have a prayer time, but I hope that you will pray. As we begin our series in Ephesians, that you will pray that God will bless us, not because of who we are, but because we're ready to trust him for great things. He's a great God. He's a powerful God, a mighty God. And we would ask, Lord, that you would do things exceedingly abundantly above all that we could even ask or imagine. That you would help start that change in me. That we would all pray that this morning. Lord, start the change in me. Maybe there are things this morning that you and I need to remember, that we need to repent of, and the things that we need to redo or begin doing. I pray that will be true. Lord, help us through the Spirit of God to be the people that you've called us to be. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.